no, no, <laughs> down there to uh, uh, if I would uh, take the lesson this morning. So, yeah. Let's start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> kind Father, <clears throat> excuse me. As we have the joy of opening your word together, we always start with prayer. Because only then the Holy Spirit can work in our hearts and in our lives and through our lives. And I just want to thank you, and we all want to thank you for that presence this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Well, <clears throat> this is the 14th week on four pages. <laughs> At the same time, I think we could learn a whole lot. We could probably spend a year on those four pages by taking a look and comparing it around. The time, uh, <coughs> where are the young people? Ron, can we help you? Oh, oh, well, you tell me when it's time to quit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, 72 AD, <clears throat> and Nero was the emperor of Rome, and it was a time of <clears throat> mayhem, time of murder, time of mandates, and Paul was in prison. Been there for two years. And we have this book, Ephesians, that he wrote to the people of Ephesus. What other books did he write when he was in? Remember? He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philippians. And he also wrote uh, to Philemon. So he had wrote, written four different what are actually circulars, if you go to Colossians chapter 4, you find he says, send this to the church of who? Laodicea. Okay, that's us. And that's what they're all meant as circular letters. That's how important they are to us today. And that's one of the reasons the authors of this lesson decided, yes, even four pages are worthwhile to study for 14 weeks. Uh, <clears throat> 1,600 years later, Alexander the Seventh was Pope of the Catholic Church. He was actually a member of the Italian crime family, and through nepotism, that means hiring family, he probably got rid of most of the budget, most of the treasury of the Catholic Church, and it was a time of Mayhem, murder, mandates, and uh, John Bunyan was in jail, like Paul was, and he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, which, <clears throat> as Ellen White pointed out, next to the Bible was her most recommended book. I would say the Bible, Ellen White's works, and John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, because it is very effective in helping us understand again, from a different perspective, what Paul here in Ephesians is talking about. Well, <clears throat> who was the one that followed up Paul in Ephesians? Do you remember? Hmm? I mean, not from your presence there. Pardon? <laughs> well, it was uh, <clears throat> John the Revelator. Spent many years there by tradition in Ephesus. It became a Christian center. Uh, if you remember Polycarp, you've heard that name before, one of the early Christians. He spent time there, likely with John the Revelator uh, in Ephesus, and it turned from, like we talked about originally, Ephesus was, you know, uh, Artismus, uh, actually, <coughs> Artismus was what's called the mother goddess of the earth. You can actually see that often in the ecology 
even nowadays, talking about Mother Earth, okay? Uh, <coughs> and uh, it's interesting to note that Ephesian, the Ephesus were very much like us. Uh, they appreciated and given to gross excess in eating and drinking. And we're not a whole lot different. Besides being Mother Earth goddess, it was also highly sensual and sexual. And we're not a whole lot different than the Ephesians are or were. But the beauty is that the Ephesians did change and became a Christian center. Because of folk like we just saw on Mission Spotlight saying, I will go. Okay? I'll take the message of God's love to other folk that really are not knowledgeable of that information. <coughs> well, <coughs> what are some of the distinctive, uh, well, yeah, and maybe distinctive would be a good way of saying it, understanding of God that Seventh-day Adventists have? And have brought to the modern Christian world. We think of the seventh day. Okay. Anything else that's not commonly believed otherwise? <coughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah, we have that. We have state of the dead. We have uh, things such as health. We have things such as the sanctuary, which uh, uh, I think most of you or many of you are aware they just had the sanctuary uh, example in Libby, and it was you know, over 1,600 people visited uh, and 300 interests. So it's a very important I will go help. We could have it here uh, in the future. Pardon? Who sponsors it? It's a <coughs> that was sponsored by the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Libby, but it's uh, uh, the actual folk who do it. I'd have to find their address and number. I don't know. I uh, do you know, Pastor? Yeah, yeah, they're a long ways away. As I, I they don't come out here all the time, but yeah, they do travel. Frequently, they've been going for decades, uh, so it's. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> very, very effective witness. But other things that Seventh Day Adventists have that we've contributed to modern Christianity. It's unusual. You know. <laughs> We talk about the second coming, you know, and maybe I won't go too far into that. Actually, the Bible never says second coming. It's interesting to know that works if you're a lumper, if you're a splitter, you can find many times that Christ came to this earth, uh, and it depends on how much you want to split it to how many times it can be. Uh, really, the most distinctive thing is an overarching concept we found in Ephesians. And we didn't talk about much about the state of the dead in Ephesians. We didn't talk much about the Seventh-day Sabbath in Ephesians. Didn't talk much about the state of the dead in Ephesians. But what was something that was in Paul wrote from the, uh, the prison that he thought was extremely beneficial? And you'll find it in the first chapter, you'll find it in the second chapter, you'll find it partially in the third chapter. Uh, <coughs> it's actually spread throughout Scripture, but Paul brought it repeatedly there in the book of Ephesians. Well, you know, what you want is unity in Christianity. Unity? <coughs> well, certainly <coughs> that's an important factor. Uh, uh, nearly all, what would you say, uh, thinking persons uh, have considered that pr as a problem, whether it's between brothers and sisters, whether it's between marital whether it's you know, within a community, whether it's in a nation. <coughs> How do we get unity? Okay. Do we have to have uniformity with it? Paul was working with that and gave the only valid way of finding unity without uniformity. But 
there's something more unusual in Ephesians that Paul shared with us repeatedly. And I know you know it <laughs> because we studied it last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's the great controversy, the doctrine of the great controversy, because it integrates together, interdigitates all the other factors that the Bible speaks of and makes it all into one understandable reality. And Paul talks about that repeatedly through and there are various ways you can split it easily. You can split it into 12 different major sections, like the 12 gates into the city, and understand the great controversy, one, two, three, four, right down through 12 different uh, as major aspects of it. Uh, the controversy between Lucifer and God. Now, sometimes we'll say between Christ and Satan, but really, Christ didn't start it. It was Lucifer, Satan, that started the controversy. And we have an example in Scripture. What are, what's the example in Scripture of the great controversy? Humans, uh, as, as the major factor, well, we think of Absalom and David. Absalom was the son, and he had controversy with his father, David. And uh, you can see right all the way through in David, God's uh, heart, okay? And that's a, an example of the great controversy, one of them, uh, uh, very straightforward in Scripture. Uh, well, let's take a look then in Ephesians 6.12. <coughs> and actually, we studied that last week but we'll just touch very lightly on it uh, because that's what we're talking about, the great controversy, 612. And uh, what's it start with there? It starts, uh, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, that's going to be important. We'll come, at, come to that later. But against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers. That's an interesting one and makes it easy to remember if you take a look at the Greek and it's cosmos craters, spelled with K-K. The cosmos craters or the world rulers, okay? And against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now that's fascinating because when you want, uh, you say you have some sins, where do you aim for? Ah, that chocolate, I want to keep looking at you. Or I keep getting irritated or angry, uh, annoyed. Uh, if you aim at that, you'll nearly always fail. What is James 4 verse 1? one and two tell us. Who would like to read James? And it's just a couple books back after uh, Hebrews there, one book after Hebrews. Where he wars and fights come from among you, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, but you do not have because you do not ask. What do we learn from that? Where does sin begin? It begins in our desires. That's what Paul is talking about when he talked here about the not against flesh and blood. That includes our flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness and spiritual forces of evil. What does evil mean? several definitions of it. It means that which is inferior. But whether you're looking at Hebrews 
language or whether you're looking at Greek language or English language, evil means the thoughts and behaviors that are disagreeable or negative moral inner qualities. What are sins? In those three languages, sins are the external manifestation, the actions of wrongdoings. So where does evil or where does sin begin? Or sins in our, and the Bible often and sometimes says, you have sin in you that gives the sins plural. Okay, it sometimes uses, equates evil and sin the same way together. But it's easier and cl more clear if you can understand it's the evil within you, the spiritual forces that we need to aim to get rid of the actions of sins, plural. Okay? In other words, evil within and sins without. That's so as long as you're looking at the action, the evil within remains. And it pops back up, just like whack a whack a mole game, if you ever had that with the kids. Okay? You whack it and it comes back up, whack it, it comes back up somewhere else. What you want to do is you want to focus on the evil within, not the actions without. And we lose a lot, and uh, often find uh, uh, you know, failure in our desires because we're going where the evil is not. We want to go on the inside. And that's what Paul's talking about with the great controversy. Don't just aim at the external actions. Aim at the internal. That's the reason the fruits of the Spirit are there. Because it's the internal changes that then guarantee the external absence of sins. Uh, and it's interesting to note, if you want to take a look at what are the three tests on evil, the three points that will lead to sins or actions. You ever looked at that in Scripture? There are three points. Remember, he was tested in all points. What's the rest of it? Like as we. Okay, so we're going to be tested in those areas. So if we're tested internally by the internal evil in those three areas, we should know those three areas. And those three areas start with Adam and Eve. Or if you want to do it in order, even Adam. Uh, and you, you have, first off, the same as Christ in the wilderness, appetite. That's a tough one. <laughs> but it's always been tough for humans. Okay? Appetite, as Paul said, uh, when we come down to our time, he said their God is their stomach. Okay? Uh, we tend to have that problem. Two, uh, Love of display. You know, you can be like God. That's display. <laughs> Big time. You can be like God. Yeah, okay. Three, uh, love of the world. That was Adam's downfall. I, I'll, I'll take Eve here in the world over God. Those were the three areas for Adam and Eve. Let's take a look at the three areas for Sodom. And that would be in Ezekiel uh, 1649. And the translators put it various ways, arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. Overfed has to do with appetite. Arrogant, that has to do with uh, uh, pride, uh, presumption, uh, Unconcerned is one of the ways that they uh, uh, interpret it. Uh, hey, we're rich and increased in goods. It's like the Laodiceans. <laughs> we really don't need anything. We don't need to treat anyone else any better than we because we're doing well. Now that were the three downfalls of Adam and Eve, the three downfalls of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> I don't know if you 
uh, stop to think about it. We talk often about the Philistines that are, you know, the, the Israelites came up. Those were all the neighbors of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. They were living in the same area, participating in the same degrading practices. And that's the reason why in Deuteronomy repeatedly Christ says, it's not because of your goodness I'm sending these folk out. It's because of their badness. Okay. <clears throat> A lot of folks say, oh, why did God get rid of these folk? They were sacrificing their children. They were sexually immoral, had sexual diseases all the way through them. We find with the archaeology uh, studies, uh, the kids had no potential for getting any better because all their grandpa and grandmas, everyone were teaching them wrong and they were immersed in wrong. And he said, I'm going to have to get rid of them. And this is the way I'm doing it okay, and giving you the land. It wasn't that he was just going out and you know, wanting to destroy kids and children. They were being destroyed already and sadly. Well, Christ... <coughs> What were the three? Well, we know that, don't we? What were the three ones in the wilderness? The three evil, inferior motives that you have to war against. First was appetite again, wasn't it? And what was the second one? <clears throat> yeah, it had... You know, you jump off this temple and everyone's going to love you. You know, they'll see what you do. And yeah, there's presumption that you're going to be taken care of. Uh, pride and presumption go together. Okay. Uh, so we're tempted in diet. We're tempted in pride. And uh, then Christ was a uh, third one. Just like Adam, love of the world. Like Adam. Adam chose Eve over God, and hey, all these kingdoms of the world, they can be yours. Okay. <laughs> so <coughs> those three evils internally, but how about us? We're another group. Are we overfed? Doesn't take a long to take a look around at the uh, ar around us. And that's why Paul said their God is their stomach. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at another one. That's uh, love of display. Sports. Dress. Cars. Okay. Do we have love of display around us? <laughs> it's, it's everywhere around us. Uh, how many toys do you have? Do you have the biggest toy? Then you have love of the world. Do we have that around us? Do we have greed? Do we have sensuality? Uh, and that leads to being unconcerned. And yeah, I don't have to be concerned. I have a big bank account. We're seeing that all through the world right now uh, as the world degrades. Okay? I can stand comfortably because I got a bigger bank account now. Uh, the same three, not that we focus on the external actions, oh, we've got to get rid of our bank account. It's changing the heart, and that's what God was saying to the rich young ruler. You, your heart needs to be changed. And yes, in doing that, you'll get rid of your bank account, and you're going to find greater riches in my love than you ever had financially with the bank account. Battlefield and the great controversy on this earth is in our minds and hearts. And that's why he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, <clears throat> let's take a look at another area. What <coughs> was the greatest point that Paul was trying to get across in Ephesians? We've studied 14 weeks now. We ought to have some good ideas of <coughs> not just specifics, but you know, general understanding of what's happening. What, what, what's he trying? 
How many times do you think Christ, him or himself, was mentioned in the book of Ephesians? I mean, it didn't say anything about his, the cross. It didn't say much about, about the seventh-day Sabbath. It uses the word, the person, Christ, or him or himself, 95-plus times in four pages. So what is Paul writing about? <laughs> He's writing about Christ. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Repeatedly, it's Christ, 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 Christ. And if you use two words, what is repeatedly utilized? Christ, or we in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. He uses that over 30 times. What does that imply in Christ? Devotion. Pardon? Devotion. Devotion? It seems like what Paul does in this is he's constantly making it reaffirm and encourage devotion to Christ. Yeah. And then in some very practical examples, we see the hard things to do. The yeah. hard things. In Christ, devoted to Christ, in Christ is another way of saying in his robe of righteousness. Okay? So forgiveness. You're devoted to Christ and you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. He says that over and over 30 times. Then he goes to the apex, the chiasmic point of his message in uh, uh, the third chapter. And what's he say there? He changes it in Christ to something different. Let's take a look. Uh, Ephesians. And as I remember, it should be there in the third <coughs> chapter. <coughs> and, uh, okay, here. Let's start with verse 16. According to the riches of his glory, <laughs> that's uh, beyond description, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. We've talked about that. It's not so that you can not do this or not do that. It's changed from the inner being, so you'll have the strength, the kindness, the gentleness, the goodness, the patience on the internal that the external will not be a problem. So that Christ may, what are the next two words? Dwell. Dwell in. In Christ is his external robe of righteousness. Christ in us is his internal robe of righteousness, Ellen White would say, and or the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? That's the point that he's trying to get to us, not just forgiveness, being in Christ, but Christ in us. He'll say that again, uh, <coughs> uh, verse uh, 19, to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge that you may be filled with. That's internal. And then you go down to verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that is work at work where? within us. You can see that Paul is not just talking about leaving this sin off, that sin off, but he's talking about changing inside so those external sins are not even a consideration. Do you see that will happen in heaven? How do you see that? Will you have to get up every morning and open your scripture and Read the Ten Commandments. I'm not supposed to kill today, and I'm not. I'm supposed to honor my mom and dad today, and I, I 
I, you know, I, I, is that what we're going to be doing? Why not? Most likely not, but we'll be resting, it says, <laughs> at least back on this earth. <laughs> In heaven and this earth, sometimes there, there might be some difference for the first thousand years. Uh, <clears throat> He'll fix our. <coughs> yeah. yeah. What we really want to change is our character from the inside. And so, as the angels, when they Lucifer first started uh, the rebellion, the angels didn't even know there was a law of God. Why? Because they're not looking at the periphery do not steal from your neighbor, they wouldn't do anything other than help their neighbor. Because there's a, uh, inside, they would never even think about that. It's that inside change that Paul is talking about. Not just the outside actions. We often deal with Adventists, as we talk, deal with other folk as we are working with them. You know, the outside, I don't smoke, don't drink, don't dance, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> but that's not where it is. It's the internal changes that need to be made, and you won't ever want to steal. You won't ever want to s destroy your body. You won't even want to harm someone else. <clears throat> and that's what it's talking about here. <clears throat> that's why the apex is Christ dwelling in us. And Colossians, remember he wrote that also in the prison? Colossians 127, what does that tell us? Colossians 127, because that's, a <coughs> that's an absolute necessity for each one of us to know and to have that particular text as a reality in our lives. Christ where? Beautiful. Christ in you. That's our only hope of going. Not making sure we don't get irritated. Not making sure that we don't use marijuana. Not making sure that uh, you know, uh, we're not upset at our neighbor. Those are all externals. When Christ comes within, those are all taken care of. We don't even need to worry about them. That's where the focus needs to be, and that's what the great controversy that Paul is talking about in the book of Ephesians is with spiritual forces, not with external actions. Okay? And that's the reason we often fail. Well, let's, uh, we took a look at uh, Christ, and we took a look there. Let's take a look at the memory text. <coughs> and that is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For, uh, that's a, uh, a function word to show purpose or selection, okay? For by grace. When was grace first found on this earth? That was a beautiful grace, but even before that, he created this world. It was Luke 3.38 that says, Adam, the son of God. Did Adam have anything to do with becoming the son of God? Did he earn it? <laughs> was it something he deserved? How about you when you were born? Uh, <coughs> did you deserve to be born? Did, had you done something to be able to have that privilege and have the privilege of a mother to change your diapers, it happens, <laughs> to father to feed you and to shelter you, we, we had nothing to do with it. That's total grace. 
this whole world began with grace. And yes, it continued uh, uh, when Adam was, uh, he went the wrong direction. He said, where are you? Okay. He continues coming. Surely goodness and mercy shall chase after me or follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell by God's grace. Some other major areas that we look at and we sometimes miss grace. That was the beginning of the world. How about the beginning of the Israelite nation? Did they deserve any of the things that occurred while they were in Egypt to bring them out of Egypt? <laughs> they had done nothing to deserve any of that. And so, you, I hope you've looked and noticed in Exodus 20, uh, <coughs> and uh, we often say Ten Commandments, uh, <coughs> but without the preliminary it becomes a lot more meaningless. Verse 2 of 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That was grace. Deuteronomy 5 says exactly the same thing as it repeats the Ten Commandments. What is Egypt symbolic of? Slavery to sin. Okay. Our existence began with grace. Israel's nation, as a nation, people, Hebrew at that point, began as grace. Uh, for by grace, it says, you have been saved. Does that mean pretty soon he's going to come and take us home? It says past tense, isn't it? Have been is not present tense. It's not future tense. It's past tense. You have been saved. Every word of scripture is of value to us. For by grace you have been saved. What have we been saved from? Pardon? Well, ultimately, but have been is past tense. We've been, if we make that choice to be, have, to be in Christ, we are have been saved from the guilt of sin. And as soon as you've been saved from the guilt of sin, you're freed. That's what it's saying. You have been saved from the guilt of sin. And Paul, in Ephesians 3, what we just read, you will be saved from the power of sin. That's why he said, Christ in you. What was the reason why Christ came to this earth? Pardon? Yeah, and how is he going to do that? What did Genesis 126 tell us? We were created in his likeness. We turned away from that likeness. And here... You have been saved not only from the... And the reason why Christ came was to put his character back into man. We were created in the image of God. We went away and lost that image. And he wants to recreate that image, which is his character, back inside of us. That's why the apex of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 has to do with Christ in us. Because we can't do it of our, own, of our own selves. We can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, I live not I, but Christ who lives in me. That's where the spiritual battle is on the inside and making sure that Christ is living in you. 
And that's what Paul was talking about here. Uh, <clears throat> we have been saved from the guilt and the power of sin through faith. That's a whole other subject we could talk about. And that not of yourselves. What's that remind of you in Scripture? Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, chapter 19. Everything the Lord says, we will do. <laughs> Not of yourselves, you won't. If they could have just come up with the reality, Lord, we can't. You know, we've been in the slavery of sin for too long. You know, help us, Lord. We, there would have been a totally different way of seeing the Hebrew nation or the functioning of the Hebrew nation. And that not of yourselves. In other words, it's not a slavish authoritarianism, not a works trip, like the first part of Isaiah 58 talks about. It's not that. It's not not doing this, not doing that, not doing the other. That's not how you're saved. And we need that information as Seventh-day Adventists as much as any of the rest of our Protestant brothers and sisters. Uh, <coughs> And that not of yourselves, it is the gift. A gift is always a loss to somebody and a gain for someone else. Who is it a loss to? If the giver, if God is giving, he's losing. But that's what heaven is all about. The more you give, the more you gain. Just the opposite of what Lucifer tried to say, the more you grasp, the more you keep. Okay? It only lasts for a short while. And the discomfiture comes even within hours after it comes. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll continue with that. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. We are, and he, he actually goes twice. You know, it is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. You remember some times in Scripture that he tried to illustrate that big time? What about Gideon? You know, <laughs> it's not you that are going to save, and it's not a, your power of your army. And we'll... we'll Pare it down to 300 people. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> you'll find out it's not you. It's not of yourselves. These are statements about illustrations of theology. Theology means the understanding of God, what he's like, all throughout Scripture. Okay? Uh, <coughs> not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are... His workmanship, as you are. We are his workmanship. It's not what we've accomplished, what we've kept from. And we might be able to purify the house. Christ talked about the fellow who was able to make his room totally clean. Uh, but he hadn't filled it with righteousness. <laughs> and uh, seven times the number of devils came back in. Okay. It's not what we don't do that counts. That's like that rich, I, I've not done this since my youth. I haven't done that. I haven't done that. Hey, Lord, I'm pretty good, you know. <laughs> I haven't. And he says, really, it's a heart change. You know, give the, have a heart that is willing to give for others. Created, <laughs> where's his workmanship? Created in Christ Jesus. There's that in again, in Christ, for good works. What do you think about that? You're created for good works. Pardon? <laughs> what did he start this world? He started and came down and created doing good for us. 
grace. We didn't deserve it. And that's what he created us for, is to, like you say, continue those good works for others. That's why we were created. His workmanship created to do good works. But they're not our works. Philippians 2.13, for it's Christ who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Because you put Christ in you, that's the change that Paul talks about in Ephesians 3, the apex of Christianity, is not just in Christ, vitally important. It has to come before. But the second step is Christ in us, just like walking, bipedal, gait. Okay? <coughs> Created in for good works which God prepared beforehand. We already talked about that we should walk in them. <coughs> What are those good works? Those good works are... Sharing pardon? Sharing, sharing him. Selfless. I'm not looking... Oh, I don't want to go up to that door. Or I don't want to speak to that uh, uh, grocery clerk. Okay? Uh, yeah, they might think I'm kind of weird if I you know, uh, talk about God with them. Share it. Okay? <laughs> Share it. Uh, <coughs> the uh, selfless love is revealed only by selfless actions. Could Paul touch upon this with some very specific examples of yeah. some of our general relation Good. in this Ephesians chapter 4? Okay. Yeah. Um, and don't do these things. But what's the alternative? I love chapter five, verse one. Therefore, <coughs> therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Yeah. So an imitator of God is not so much you don't do what God doesn't do, because children see things yeah. in their parents, and that's what they copy. Yeah. So we have the perfect example of Christ. He came to show that to us. So what are we to do when we see suffering? We are to relieve suffering. Yeah. When people need food, we're to, you know, the list can go on and on and on. Um, but, you know, the work comes in this continual uh, giving up and giving. realizing that things are being driven out of us. Yes. And the struggle is to let those tendencies be driven out. You know, I, the, the, well put. The, the, the example of my life that um, has occurred, um, uh, I'll just put out there, you know, I, raised um, and had I, I, I could do carpentry I was a journeyman carpenter by the time I finished uh -huh. high school and then was helping my <coughs> family move to California and moved there and I worked with my dad and brother in law in the world of construction and then the mining was just horrible when I got there yeah. and I, I was picked up for it you know? yeah. and, and if, I, if I remove myself from it and leave and go to school and I, I, it was easy to get away but I tell you I go back and it starts to sink in real easy <laughs> and not very much time at all. Yeah. So, you know, to me, that kind of is, it's a warning to us. Um, God says, don't put yourself in a place where you start imitating what's around you. Yeah. Don't let what's around you do things you don't want to have imitated. Yeah. And, and that's, I don't, I don't look at that as works. No. I look at that as, uh, as following the instruction that he's given. Yeah. Is copy me. <laughs> and in time, I'll get you a heart where And the next three, four words that you and you finish, imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Yeah. That's... But I can blow that. And oh, you, we all do. We walk in that selfless love. Not earthly love, but selfless 
love. That's heavenly love, a totally different kind of love. And yeah, yeah. Continually. But that, but that it's real. Yeah. And, and Peter even said, you can't give your life. And I'm going to talk about it next week or in, in, on my trip coming up. Yeah. And it's going to be about the church. It's going to be about our marriage. It's just yeah. going to go down this road of really big relationship issues now. Yeah. That you're going to grow up in. And I'm going to tell you a point on about what you walk in this world with. What you eat with. What you do with. What you do with. Um, loving relationship as, as our Lord. And that's bottom line, as you mentioned, unity, loving relationships. That's what he's looking for, selfless, loving relationships. It starts from the inside, it's not what you're doing on the outside, uh, that we should walk in them. Created, it says you're created in Christ Jesus. I think we could probably also say recreated in Christ Jesus. Genesis 1.26, make man in our image. Christ came to recreate us into his image. That's internal, of which the external is only the manifestation of that internal. And I know you don't have the beeper yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's bow our heads, kind Father. Thank you so much for giving us, through Paul, instructions from your heart. And may they come, dear Father, and be recognized, appreciated, and applied in each one of our hearts and through our lives to all those around us. The works that you have prepared for us, the good works, Christ in us, becoming the hope of glory. Thank you in Christ's precious name. Amen.